welcome back to Equity and Focus. I am your host, Kevin Hooks. Man, today I'm excited. We are exploring the artistry behind the scenes with Magic DaCosta, a mastermind in the world of hairstyling for film and television. He's renowned as a color killer and a cut slayer from Atlanta to L.A. Brother, welcome to Equity and Focus. Hey, my man. How are you? I'm better than I deserve, brother. I appreciate you joining us. <laughs> it's good to be here. It's good to be here. I had to take a few minutes out and chop it up with you. I love it, man. Listen, before we get started, hey, tell the audience, who's Magic DaCosta? Who? Magic DaCosta is a hair assassin. Um, I have been doing this for the better part of 20 years. I have been in television and film for about eight. I was in talent, so I used to travel with um, singing artists before that for a few years. I've owned a salon. I've been an educator. I've done a platform. When it comes to hair, I have done. So, yeah, that's just who I am. I am there, I guess. <laughs> wait, 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 wait. Help me understand, man. You know, everybody got their little monikers that they go by, but Cut Slayer, Hair Assassin, where does it come yeah. from? Yeah, because I, I, I kill hair, man. I kill every dude I do. <laughs> yeah. And look, and, and my other moniker is why be typical when you can be magical? Why? <laughs> I, lo I love it. I love it. So wait a minute. Was this? Wait a minute. Have you always kind of had this attitude toward everything in your life, even as a as a kid? Yeah, that's how. I, that, that's how you got to go into it. And if you own room when you walk in, ain't nobody gonna question why you did. I heard that. I heard that. So hair. I mean, you know, it's kind of a non-traditional uh, uh, direction. How did you get interested in it? And then how did you hone your craft? I was kind of thrown into it. I'm the oldest of five kids. Okay. Uh, I have three sisters underneath me. So my mom worked uh, 12 hours. She was uh, RN, so she worked overnight. So I would have to get my sisters ready for school in the morning. And as they got older, it just went from ponytails to curl my bang to flip this under. So um, I feel like doing hair is a natural talent, just like singing or playing an instrument. You already have the natural ability and you learn, you go to school to hone that God-given talent. Okay. So it's just something that you have naturally. So I knew I had it. I didn't do it for a while. And um, when my grandfather got sick, I needed a job where I could um, be able to take him to his appointments when he needed to go. So I was like, you know what, I'm going to go to hair school. And so that's how that's how hair found me. All right, so listen, I understand that sometimes, man, it's already in you. You just yeah. got to pull it out and then maximize it. So speaking about maximizing, how did you turn it into a business? What was the step after you got out of school and said, I'm going to make this something I can make money off of? The whole purpose of me going into it was to make money initially. Okay. That's why I opted towards ladies' hair versus men's hair, because you can make more dollars over there. Um, mm -hmm. I've always been um, prone to the next. I live my life in bullet points. And as soon as I hit that bullet point, the next bullet point that I said, I've already moved on to the next one. I'm not one to like really relegate it like, oh, well, you've reached that milestone. Let's, let's chill here for a minute. I'm already thinking about the next thing. That's just always how I've been. So I started, when I got my license, I started working in the salon. The salon I started working in in November, I bought mail the next year. Oh, wow. Because the owner was leaving. I was like, well, I don't want to move nowhere else. So I bought that salon. I stayed there for a year and a half. After I had done that, I bought another salon. So as I had two booming salons in Tennessee, I said, I'm moving to Atlanta because it's bigger than this for me. So that's what I say. Like, it's all for me, my career has just been about conquering one thing and as soon as you conquer that move on to the next i don't yeah. get caught up in yeah no i think i think that's great but you know when i think about you know stylists particularly you know the time you spend with your clients oftentimes become therapeutic for your clients so yeah. talk about some of those experiences and what you've learned that will that really help you become sort of more than just a hairstylist you are definitely a psychiatrist of sorts uh you deal with, with your clients, you deal with the most intimate parts of their lives, especially in the salon. Like you, you grow up with, you see your clients, kids grow up. You, you go through marriages, divorces, babies, 
Mm -hmm. uh, deaths, all of these things happen um, in your chair. And one main thing that really um, translated into me stepping into this side of the business was um, learning discretion and how to hold what you hear and what you see. Like that's been a big part of why I've been so successful in this in this arena, um, because celebrities they guard their information, yeah. and you really can't get in until you're vetted. So like the hardest part is is getting your first one, because once you get the first one, you will yeah. move after because they because because that first one will vet you, it'll let you know oh, okay, all right, they know how to move in the room. And that's just how it is. So that's that's been one of the biggest lessons I learned was, you know, how to hold stuff. You know, you don't yeah. share everything and they share with you. Yeah, so establishing trust clearly is an important component. Yeah. So, you know, we you know, we nosy on my show, Equity and Focus. So to yeah. you, you could talk about some of your clients without giving away the farm. Who are some of the people you've worked with in some of the films you worked on? Oh, okay. Now I can say now that's easy. Uh <laughs> ooh, let's see. I've worked with Brandy. I've worked with Monica. I've worked with Escape. I've worked with Look Kim. I've worked with Nick Cannon, Mike Epps, uh, Dion Cole. Uh, oh God! Hey, bro, uh, Dion's come up, man. I'm gonna give you credit for that because Dion Cole's come up, brother, from the early days of his comedy till now. You hey, got something to do with that new style. <laughs> let's talk about my boy Dion. So yeah. yeah, I did. He had a show that was on BT Plus. If you have not, it's on BT Plus and Paramount Plus. Mm -hmm. If you have not checked this show out, it's called Average Joe. Check out this show. It is not what you think Dion Cole's show would be. It's dark humor. I mean, like his father robs a Russian mob man for ten million dollars, and the entire show was about the Russian mob coming at him and his family to get the money back. Mm -hmm. That was one of my stuff. So. Okay. Show is amazing, man. Really, really check this out. He has a um a Netflix special coming up soon too. The taping is in a couple of months. It's in May actually in LA. So yeah, Dion Cole is that's my that's my guy too. He, he's yeah. good people, man. <laughs> so listen, yeah. I also know like you know back to a little bit about the therapeutic part of it. I also feel like when you look good, it gives you a different kind of confidence. And when you walk on stage, I know that yeah. some of the talent you've worked with have to feel that way. So talk about some of the red carpets and stuff with people, you know, they was ready and you was like, boom, you just been magic. <laughs> okay. Uh, Melissa Williams from Tyler Perry show, Ruthless. Uh -huh. Very, very good friend of mine. Uh, we got to the BT awards actually this last year. Uh, and when we got there, she was like, ah, this dress I got ain't, ain't revealing enough. So mm -hmm. me being me, I go to I go to the showroom, pull something else out. So now not only am I the hairstylist, now I'm the dress of the red carpet. <laughs> <laughs> but like I say, at least you kind of learn uh, all avenues of the industry after you work in it for a while. Now, don't get it wrong. Shout out to all my costume designers and my stylists out there because I do not take it lightly. And just because I have put on a dress on somebody that I am not stylist, that's not it for me. Yes. But when I put when I pushed it to the corner, I can come out and I can make it happen. And the thing <laughs> is, she hit she hit all she hit all the press, so that means we did something right. So that's all that matters. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. So, but one of the things that really occurred to me as I was doing research and prepping for today's conversation is that master educator part of your background. Talk about like really when you bring people into the fold, like how you're building a legacy of people who draft off of what you've learned. How I became a master educator. Uh, actually, is a lesson I learned in its own. Like, I went back to, I had a good homeboy that was working at Aveda. He was like, man, come up here. And I was like, you know what? The truth is, I really need to come back and learn all the stuff I did not learn when I was in school because I thought I knew everything already. Uh -huh. <laughs> That's the truth. Yep. So, and part of training for the master educator license, it refreshed me on all that stuff that I kind of just grazed over that I didn't think was important because you know you already have your your one two that you know how to do, 
and you feel like that's all you need to know. Mm -hmm. And when you get out there, you was like, ooh, I probably should have sat on in that class that day and paid attention to this. And something that I bring to the table to my students, and I actually have a few students that actually work in the industry now that I'm in, um, working in the positions that I work in. Wow. And, uh, and and it's no it's no it's no greater pat on the back to see you know somebody that you help hone their skills to do what you do and to go on above and beyond what you've done because that's part of your legacy also. Anybody that don't be gatekeepers, be gate openers. Oh, oh. Uh, because anybody that you pour into, <laughs> it doesn't matter if they if they do better if they do bigger and better than you. That's part of your legacy too. Because they fell up under you. And that's that's what we have to get past in this. You know, always trying to now I want you to do well, just don't do better than me. Right, right. Don't 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 do better, don't get a better gig than I get. No, no, no. Get the best gig. Because then I can say, huh, you see what I did. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> hey, listen, that's a jewel. Don't be a gatekeeper, be a gate opener. I yeah. love it. Like you, you hear um, coaches in in like football talk about their coaching tree, and in martial arts, which I have a background in, one of the things we talk we learn is you become a better practitioner when you become a teacher. Does that apply in your space? Do you feel like you became better at your craft by becoming a master educator? I did. It 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 taught me patience. It um it, it taught me how to even handle my clientele um a little better because now as you can see I'm outspoken and I you know I say what come to mind uh but becoming an educator taught me to channel that because sometimes it's not a lot of times it's not what you say it's how you say it mm -hmm. it's the delivery on how you give something and so like that has that has really even brought my career as far as um in the television and film going into interviews with the executives and the directors to book the gigs to, to run these shows. Mm -hmm. So be, being educated really, um, learning to be an educator really helped me in all of that, helped me in my personal person skills, my interpersonal skills, things like that. So, yeah, I agree. Yeah, so how much of it is uh, when you're teaching is the technical aspects of this is how you do X, Y, or Z, and how much of it is – is a mentality that inspires creativity. It's it's equal parts. Okay. Um, normally, by the time you get to me, you already have, especially now, you, mm -hmm. you you've already proven yourself to have a skill set. So, I'm more or less just teaching you how to hone that skill set into a niche that is going to befit you. Mm -hmm. So, like. Technicality, I still can, we can iron sharp as iron so we can all learn something from every every other um, industry industry person. So like anybody who's a stylist, you can always learn something from another stylist. And the, and the time that you stop learning is the time that you should stop anyway. When you feel like you got it all, it's time mm -hmm. to quit. Yeah, it's, it's, time to, it's time to buy. But, um, but so it's more me, you know, kind of finding what, what their thing is, you know, mm -hmm. where where they want to fit in, what are they going to do the best, um, especially following up under my life, mentorship, you know, that's really what it is now. Versus so the of it. Yeah, you talked about the importance of, you know, continuous learning. What yeah. kinds of things do you do to keep fresh and to keep, you know, that inspiration bug inside of you coming out? Youngest do it, man. I'm telling you. These... <laughs> <laughs> The youngest do it. It ain't no ain't no better way to say it. You yeah. you you have to go back and look at what the youngest in your industry are doing mm -hmm. because they are what's next. And not saying that you have to jump on the train wholeheartedly, but you do need to be cognizant of it and at least learn a little bit of it. Because if not, then you you gonna become a dinosaur. Yeah, and. For instance, this whole um, lace wig phenomenon. Mm -hmm. you, you, we all know in the past eight to ten years, wigs have become they they're everywhere now. Yes, um, you know 
25, 30 years ago, you didn't even want, women didn't even want somebody to know that they had a track in their head. Right, right. Now it is how long my track is, and you better know that this is 40 inches. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you better know this 40 right. inches. You know, yeah. you know I spent a check on this. But um, so back to just the lace wigs, when that first came out, I was like, I'm not, I'm not getting into that, man. I'm not, I'm not what? And I kept seeing it, and I said, no, no, I better go get into that now. <laughs> you got to learn how to do that, mm-hmm. because if you don't learn how to do it, they're going to go to who knows how to do it. Right. So you have got, you have got to stay. So that's why I say the youngest people in, the, in, you, in your given industry, especially in this industry, you have mm-hmm. to pay attention to what they're doing and get a piece of it, because if you don't, you become the dinosaur, and then you ain't got no buckets. <laughs> Yeah, no, listen, so what do you say to the young people that are sort of, you know, stretching the boundaries and coming up with these new approaches, but they aren't getting traction like you already have? What do you say to them to help them get there? Your career is a building, and you have to look at it as such. You, It, it, it does not happen overnight. Like, it is basically laying a foundation, and it's brick by brick. And you know each, and it's and the more bricks that you put on it, the larger your building becomes. So it it comes in time, whatever whatever that looks like. And so like even when you spoke of traction, um, it's some steps that you have to make to do whatever it is that your what your end goal is. If your end goal is working in the industry, like I work in. You, you can't live in Nashville, Tennessee, or Oklahoma and say that you want to do what I do because they don't do that in Nashville or Oklahoma. And I don't care how great you are, in Nashville or Oklahoma, this industry is not there, so you're not going to be able to work in this industry. So you have to step out on faith. You have to do some, you have to do some of the work yourself. Yeah. That's, that's what, that, so I say, you know, like, you have to go after what you want. And if you see yourself in a place Position yourself in that place for it to happen. It's interesting because you, you early on, you mentioned the importance of patience. And I feel like that's sort of the message. And it's just like Hollywood. There's no such thing as an overnight success. No. Uh-uh. <laughs> yeah. All you see is an IG post. You don't see all the hard work that it took to get there. Right. Yeah. Right. right. It's funny. I heard somebody say, we have to stop judging people by their highlight reels. And yeah. And behind the curtain. <laughs> for real. <laughs> Because that's where the tears are. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so listen, man, you are you're you're the industry full of like, you know, we call I call them stakes in the grass. Like they're everywhere okay. in the entertainment industry. How do you keep your grass cut low enough to where you see all the stakes and avoid them? <laughs> even if it's I don't even know if you get to avoid them. Mm. You get to you just deal with people as they prove themselves to be to you. And you make sure that your work is, is exemplary. Yeah. All I can all I can control is what I do. So I make sure I do that in excellence. Mm. And then it can't be brought into question. I don't care what, what your motive was against me. Cause whatever it is for me is gonna be for me, but I made sure that I, that my stuff was done in excellence. So you can't really you can't you can't come for that. That's all. Cause snakes yeah. gonna be snake, and that's and that's an end. They 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 gonna be there. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, they gonna be there. <laughs> no, it's funny. There's a, a African proverb that says one one can sleep next to a snake as long as they know it's there. And it's just one of those things that be aware of your surroundings and navigate yeah. them accordingly. <laughs> that's it. Yeah. Already anticipate anticipate. That's that's part of it. Yeah. So expect. Yeah. So, so what excites you now about the industry? Anything happening in the industry that's got you really turned up? Well, number one, we just came out with this strike not too long ago. Some of the biggest lessons I ever learned, you know, like I had fooled myself into thinking that I was in a place of comfortability because, you know, you know, uh-huh. saved up this little bit of money in the bank and, uh-huh. you, and you really didn't do the math. And so what I'm thankful for, I'm thankful for that strike came to let me know that them three dollars in the bank wasn't hitting on nothing, and you need three <laughs> more streams of income. 
Right. So look, that, that set a new fire under my feet to get a few more things going. Um, it also reminded me of the fragility of where we are and and and, and how not to become complacent and comfortable and 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 to always be striving for something else because you know like when you get to a certain level you're like oh I'm good over here I'm yep. going where I want to go I can buy what I want to buy I can you know I can see who I want to see so I'm good mm-hmm. yeah you're not good because that is real quick. And the first couple of months, you know, we was out here on the strike. And we was out here because no one thought it was going to go a year. So we out here the first three, four months living like the strike ain't, ain't striking. Right, right, right. And then you had said, ooh, wait. Now let's spend a lot of money. Ain't, ain't no checks been dropping now. Yeah. <laughs> In four months, now you sitting up saying, ooh, all right, it's time to figure something else out. So, so I'm thankful for that. Like it ended, we're back, we're back in. And yeah. one thing I can shout out that one of my look, my boss man Tyler Perry, he he looks out for us every time. Like right after the pandemic, we were one of the first crews back in. Um, like I said, we get we get to work over here. Hey man, we we really I'm glad you brought. I am so glad you brought that up. To, you know, because there's so much sort of negative press around. Tyler and some of the things that he does. It's good for you to talk about some of the things that are really positive and actually true about the work that he's doing for employing black people, giving us chances. Talk about that a little bit. I'll ex- I'll explain this to you. So now, who cares? You know, people are, oh, well, he did that so he could make money. I'm going to say this. When we came out of the pandemic, all of these all of these mandates that were in, in the, that they came out with the mask and, and, mm-hmm. and the PP, uh, like putting on full suits when we first came back in. Um, before we could get to this, this man on his on his on his compound built housing for four hundred of us to live. Like you had your own suite, own apartment for you to live in that we lived in, and we so we would come and we would do quarantine here. They call it camp mm-hmm. quarantine here at the studio. So once you test it three times, you test it into which you got paid for, by the way. You tested it into and you came and you lived for the time that you shot the shows. No one else was doing that. Right. Like so we were back at work before anyone was. When the strike ended, the strike ended on Tuesday. We was getting called Thursday about when mm. we were coming back. To work. We were right back to work. So that's what I say, you know. And this, the roster here is it's like a family. Like I worked a lot of I worked because I've done shows for CBS, ABC, CW, all those shows. I'm the part. Uh, I'm the part here. But like the crew here is like no other crew. This is like family. When you come in. You happen to see everybody. You know, I know everybody from the the person at the gate to the to the cleaning personnel here. It's a, it's it's truly a family here, and so I'm I'm thankful for Tyler Perry. I really am. He got my resume to where it needed to be for me to go book those other jobs because yeah. when they was saying no, I hadn't done these other things. This is this is where I had the place to get those chops to say yes, I have. Yeah, he get, like he gave you a chance to invest in yourself. Yeah. Correct. No, I love that. You know, it's interesting for me. Look, I don't have no desire to invalidate anybody's experiences, whether they've been good or, you know, whether if they've had bad experiences. But people, we are we have to recognize that our, you know, our icons, they're human. So there's more, there's they not are. one thing represents them, right? Extraordinary, look, they are ordinary people with extraordinary gifts. Yes. yes. That's it. Yes. They still have they still go through the same things that we go through. No, no, it's, I it's, love that. That's it. <laughs> no, I'm glad we had a chance to talk about that. Listen, before we get out of here, uh-huh. do, I need you to think about this. In our history, there have been icons throughout history, you know, with, uh-huh. where hair was something that was a part of their reality. Jesus, hair of wool. And we think about, like, you know, um, Coretta Scott King and her beautiful hair. Like, if you had a chance 
to style uh -huh. three people from history. Pick three uh -huh. that you would be like, yo, I would kill that hairdo. Three people from history. Um, oh, North Dandridge. Woo, that's a great one. Oh, that's a good one. Yeah. Oh, that's good. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, Lena Horne. Mm. Cicely Tyson. I love it. I love it. Now we got to do. Now we gotta do the next one. Who haven't you done that you would love to touch? Well, go on and give me the B. <laughs> hey, yo, oh. hey, no offense, Jay. I want to be in the room with you, brother. <laughs> what it happened? Okay, come on. Look, yes, and, and shout out to her hairstylist who, who is a partner of mine. But yeah, okay. I want your job, brother. <laughs> <laughs> hey, man, this has been a great conversation, man. Tell my audience where they can find you. Man. Where can they find you, man? What's your, I, what's your IG handle, uh, et cetera? IG, I'm at Walla Magic. W-A-L-A-M-A-J-I-K. Get at your boy. <laughs> Yo, it's been a real pleasure diving into the world behind the camera with you today. Thank you for sharing your journey you so and your much. expertise with us. And to our viewers, thank you for joining us on Equity and Focus. I'm Kevin Hooks reminding you the magic happens both on screen and behind the scenes. See you next time on Equity and Focus.